This is a mechanism of disease map for urinary tract infection, or UTIs. I'll be talking about the etiology of UTIs, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of UTIs. As in all of these flowcharts, the boxes are color-coded according to this legend up here. Let's get started. So at the center of UTIs, the central pathophysiology, which is really just a definition of UTI, a rewording of the title, is that you have pathogen growth in the urinary tract. Now there are several bacteria that can cause this, and I'll talk about them one by one. And there are also predisposing factors that can lead to pathogen growth in the urinary tract. This includes things that increase your risk of seeding an infection, things that irritate the urethral meatus, or the urethra in general, and things that cause your urine to sit still, urinary stasis. All of those will predispose you to pathogen growth in the urinary tract. So let's go through the bacteria, and bacteria are overwhelmingly the most common types of pathogens that cause UTIs. Number one on the list within bacteria is E. coli. They make up 80%-ish of the bacteria that cause UTIs, and it's really the go-to if you just have to suspect somebody has a UTI. It's usually because of E. coli. There are some others, um, and you can remember the other bacteria that cause UTIs with the mnemonic seek PP. Um, kind of immature, um, kind of funny, but it's helpful. That stands for Staphylococcus saprophyticus, um, E. coli, which we mentioned, Enterobacter species, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Pseudomonas, and Proteus mirabilis. So these are the most common bacteria found in UTIs. There's a couple notes, a couple specific things to know about some of them. Women who are postmenopausal are even further predisposed to E. coli, and the mechanism by which that happens is listed out here. When you're postmenopausal, it's a low estrogen state. There are significant hormonal changes that happen during and after menopause. The low estrogen leads to low lactobacilli in the vaginal flora. This means that, vag that the vaginal pH will go up. You'll have a more basic pH. The lactobacilli made it an acidic environment. That more basic pH predisposes you to growing E. coli. And I didn't mention this earlier, but E. coli is also present in the colon. It's uh, prominent in our gut bacteria. So that's uh, one way that E. coli is largely seeded, causing uh, UTIs. These um, bacteria, Pseudomonas, Enterococci, and Serratia, they are associated with increased drug resistance. So a patient that's hospitalized, that might be on antibiotics for a while, they might be predisposed to these three. And lastly, Proteus produces a lot of ammonia. You might remember from learning about kidney stones that this can lead to struvite stones, which are these big stones that can cause staghorn calculi. The ammonia also has a specific smell, so you might have a particularly pungent urine in UTIs caused by Proteus mirabilis. Okay, so that's it for the urinary tract infections. In um, some cases, you might have a viral UTI. This is more rare. It's usually in patients that are immunocompromised, such as with HIV AIDS. Um, a few viruses that cause this are adenovirus, cytomegalovirus, and BK virus. And the only real association you should keep with this is that they can cause hemorrhagic cystitis. But otherwise, the overwhelming amount of UTIs will be caused by bacteria, um, especially E. coli. Okay, next, some things that predispose you to seeding infections. Um, firstly, being female through a couple of mechanisms. Women have shorter urethras, which mean that the bacteria that goes up into your urinary tract have a shorter distance to travel. In addition, the urethra and the anal region and genital regions in women are much closer than they are in men, partially because of this shorter urethra, partially because of just women's anatomy. And this means that bacteria from the anal and genital regions can more easily seed the urethra in women. So that's an association that's worth knowing. Men, as I mentioned, have much lower chances of having UTIs. I think it's like 20 times more in women than men. Um, the only men that are really predisposed are uncircumcised infants. So newborns up to the age of six months old that are uncircumcised might be a little bit predisposed to seeding their urethra um, and having an infection. Next, a few things that cause irritation of the urethral meatus. 
First, there's sexual intercourse. This is also called postcoital cystitis, or in some cases, honeymoon cystitis. Of course, a lot of the heat and the fluids that you might experience during sexual intercourse can irritate your urethromiatus and also seed an infection that way. There are also catheter-associated urinary tract infections. This is a common way um, in patients that are hospitalized for a long time uh, to get UTIs. These catheters that are in for a long time, say a week or so, can irritate the urethromiatus, and they can also seed infections through that catheter, which is essentially a tube to the outside world. There's also an association between these cauties, these catheter-associated urinary tract infections, with increased drug resistance. Because as you can imagine, patients that are in the hospital with catheters for a long time are also likely getting some kind of antibiotic that might predispose them to getting a pseudomonas UTI. Lastly, a few things that cause urinary stasis. There are some listed here. Benign prostatic hyperplasia in men. If your prostate gets very big and it obstructs your urethra, it's going to cause urinary obstruction and that'll cause urinary stasis. Same with urinary bladder diverticulum. Can also block the flow of urine, cause urinary stasis. And in general, when things in the body are static, when things stop flowing, like your um, gallbladder, bile, fluids, or your um, urine, things back up and things get infected. So that's what's happening here. Your urine becomes static and it allows the pathogen to grow as opposed to constantly flushing it out. Urinary tract calculi, like kidney stones, can also cause a UTI if they get stuck in the urethra. Your neurogenic bladder, like in late stage diabetes, when you have uh, your nerve damage that no longer lets you squeeze your urine out, that can also cause urinary stasis. You can also have vesicoureteral reflux, which is when the fluid actually flows backwards throughout your um, urinary tract. There are a couple things that cause this. Congenital malformations are more common in children, and in reproductive age women, pregnancy um, and the hormone changes associated with pregnancy can actually cause a vesicoureteral reflux and can actually also directly cause urinary stasis as well. One last cause, chronic constipation, especially in children, can also cause urinary stasis. And um, that's, as I mentioned, a, a more common in pediatric patients than in adults. So we've covered the etiology of UTIs, and the pathophysiology is kind of integrated within this, these increased risk of seeding infections, the irritation of the umeatus, and urinary stasis. Um, now it's time to go into the manifestations of UTIs. The most common manifestations happen just from irritation of your lower urinary tract. So you have bacterial growth, you have maybe a weak immune response, and that causes irritation to those tissues, to the bladder, to the urethra, and um, that manifests in a few ways. The patient might have increased urinary frequency, they might have urinary urgency, they can have dysuria or pain with urination, they can have hematuria, this can be a gross hematuria where you see blood in the urine, it can also be a microscopic hematuria where you might only notice a few red blood cells when you take a, lo a look at the urine under the microscope. In more severe cases you can also have suprapubic tenderness or pain just kind of uh, above their bladder in their lower abdomen. As the infection progresses, it can ascend up to the kidneys, and this is called pyelonephritis. In the process of this happening, the patient can have other manifestations, more severe manifestations. These are listed here. This can include fever. The patient can just generally feel unwell, fatigue, malaise. They can have costovertebral angle tenderness. This is essentially pain over your kidneys in your back. They can have flank pain, um, and they can also have nausea and vomiting. As this infection progresses, it can get even worse. You can have urosepsis, for instance, which might exacerbate the fever and the fatigue and the malaise. And if urosepsis gets even worse, the patient can be in septic shock, and they can have hypotension, tachycardia, and tachypnea, um, typical signs and symptoms of shock. Other complications of UTIs include the perinephric abscess, which can, of course, uh, predispose you to all of these symptoms and exacerbate them even more. And lastly, it's worth mentioning the emphysematous pyelonephritis. This is when you have a gas-forming bacteria that gets all the way up into your kidneys and you end up with gas. You usually notice this on imaging of the kidneys. Um, there shouldn't be gas in your kidneys, and if you do have it, you might suspect an emphysematous pyelonephritis. There are a few special considerations, maybe unique manifestations in specific patient populations. In the elderly, for instance, patients with UTIs might have delirium or active, uh, sorry, acute confusion. This is thought to be due to these cytokines that end up 
in the central nervous system and activate these toll-like receptors. But in general, inflammation caused by a UTI in elderly people can cause delirium or confusion. In pediatric patients, it might be hard to identify um, the UTI because the patient might not be able to communicate that they have dysuria, that they have pain with urination. Kids might just be irritable, they might have poor feeding, they might have new urinary incontinence in a pediatric patient that was previously potty trained. So that might be a sign of a UTI. In pregnant patients, the UTI can cause hypertension. It can also cause preeclampsia and preterm labor. So we tend to screen pregnant women for asymptomatic bacteria. Lastly, a few complications specific to men as the UTI infection ascends through the male genital tract. If the infection gets to the prostate, they can have prostatitis. Some unique symptoms here include pain around the prostate. So this means in the perineal region, in the pelvic region, or in the lower back. They can even have pain with defecation in some cases. This is because as you pass a stool, um, if it's a large stool, for instance, it might rub against the prostate on its way out of your colon, on, the, on, on, on its way out of your rectum, and that can cause pain with defecation and prostatitis. The UTI can also go up into the um, testicles. That would be orchitis. And some specific symptoms here, as you might expect, are swollen, tender testicles. Lastly, if the infection gets to the epididymis, you can have epididymitis. Some specific symptoms here are scrotal pain. Um, if the, in, in epididymitis, in order to differentiate it from testicular torsion, you might look for this pren sign, and that's when the epididymitis pain is reduced when the testicle is elevated. So that's how you differentiate it from testicular torsion, and epididymitis can be caused by an underlying urinary tract infection. Lastly, kind of in a more chronic um, sense, if you have ongoing UTIs in the male genital tract, they can be predisposed to urethral strictures. This, of course, causes a bladder outlet obstruction, um, similar to some of the things we saw here, where your outlet um, for your urine is obstructed. There are some unique symptoms here. Again, these are more for the chronic case after many UTIs or after chronic inflammation of the urethra that caused a stricture. Those symptoms are incomplete bladder emptying, straining to urinate, and a weak urinary stream. That has been it for this mechanism of disease map for urinary tract infection. I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.